Hi there and welcome to this video. In my last video I talked about the Atomos Ninja 5 um, monitor and recorder that I'm using in collaboration with my Z-series mirrorless cameras. I mentioned in that video that it's a great piece of kit um, but the manual that comes with it, whilst it's good in some areas, there are a couple of areas where it doesn't go into enough detail to really help you get up and running with it. Um, the Ninja 5 is aimed at a more pro end of video capture, and we shouldn't forget that. Um, however, for someone like me that is really trying to up my game, it, there are a couple of gaps, and one of those was around the choice of output codecs. So in this video, I'm going to um, just try and give you a bit of a, uh, an insight into that. As I mentioned, one of the aims of using the um, Ninja 5 was really I was finding that I wanted to push my video to the next level and therefore I had to up my skills, up my knowledge in various areas. You know, I acknowledge I'm no expert in this, I'm learning. And in this video I'll try and simplify uh, what I've picked up and what I've learned around codecs. If you want a more technical, deeper understanding then go and check out um, people like Gerald Undone's videos. Really great, real detail from a real expert. I'm going to look at it from a more layman's perspective, uh, someone who's developing their skills and try and simplify it. There is a risk this video could be a bit uh, longer than normal, but I'll try and keep it pacey. It's going to be a balance of technical insight with real world experience. As I said, when I've picked up the Ninja 5, it has forced me to get a deeper understanding and really look at what's right for me and where I am on my journey in developing my video capabilities and skills. So let's start with a recap into my use case. So firstly, I produce videos like this. You know, they're studio based, there's controlled lighting. Um, so they're relatively straightforward. I produce in 4K and predominantly for YouTube. So, you know, it's for the small screen and I shoot, edit, render and upload. So it's fairly simple workflow. I'm not using multiple cameras in general. Um, the second use case is I'm increasingly doing some outdoor videos and there I've got a challenge of um, a variable light so there's more shade and sun, um, higher contrast, however they're still fairly basic. They tend to be single scene um, videos, um, they're not multi-camera, I try and avoid too much colour grading so they are pretty basic. But over both of those types of video use cases, I do aim for quality and that's quite important to me. So back to the Ninja 5, because that's where it fits into my workflow. I found the Ninja 5 pretty intuitive, um, but there are a lot of different options in it, as you'd expect from um, a device that's designed to sit from the upper end of um, enthusiast video producer into the the more pro area. And as I say, the manual helps you to understand the functionality and the capabilities of the Ninja 5, but it's really important to work out what are your settings. And they really need to match both the camera you're using, the settings you're using in the camera, and also your use case. And that's where there are so many different options or blends of options across the Ninja 5. It's difficult for a manual to tell you what is the optimum for what you're trying to do. And that's what I've had to really try and develop. So the output options and the codecs that go with that are a great example of this. The Ninja 5 comes preloaded with various um, codecs, including the Apple ProRes codecs, and you can activate the Avid DNX HDR codecs for free. Um, if I discount the ProRes RAW, because I'm not using that, I've got seven different options, and in my initial enthusiasm, I set the output codec to ProRes HQ, the highest level quality, because my logic was, if I capture at that level of quality, I can always downgrade later, whereas if I capture at a lower quality and find I need higher quality, you can't, it's not as easy to go the opposite direction. Now, what I found was I was getting gigabytes and gigabytes of footage, and while storage is cheap, the processing capability um, was really, really challenging at the high quality level. If you also overlay the options around, you know, the use of N-Log, for example, I was getting increasingly challenged around, was I doing the right thing? It didn't feel like it was the right thing. And therefore I took a step back and did some research. I started by looking at some technical reading and I've also done some real world testing. 
So what we'll do in this video is now really I'll give you an insight into what I learned from the technical reading and I'll give you an insight into the real world case um, research that I did as well. So what we're often asking our hybrid cameras like the Z series to do is quite challenging. In the past we've traditionally focused on still images and data transfer whilst a challenge was not too bad in those. You know it could cause buffering if we were trying to shoot perhaps at high frames per second um, but what we're trying to do with video and ask a stills camera or a hybrid camera to do both stills and video is really challenging. And this is what I've been learning, is that bandwidth and data transfer is critical. And the amounts of data with 4K video at some of these higher end codecs can be absolutely massive. And therefore it's really important to think about the end-to-end -end workflow and the different technical components that go into that end-to-end -end workflow. So let's start with a baseline. Um, if we consider the in-camera capability, then we know that the Z6 and Z7 can capture 8-bit um, video in camera up to 4K um, 30 frames per second. And it does this at a compression, luminance compression of 420. Now, if you want to understand what 420 or 422 or 444 means, I'd suggest you again go and check out one of Gerald Undone's videos. It's really once you get into it, it's quite understandable, and he does a great job around that. Now, the in-camera um, video compression uses the H.264 codec, which is pretty um, standard across many different devices. And I could only find the um, data rate transfer speeds for 1080p rather than 4K, and that's 144 megabits per second, which equates to 65 gigabytes per hour. So you can fit about an hour um, of video recording at 1080p onto a 64 gigabyte card. So that's our baseline. Now if we start looking at the Apple ProRes codex and we start with the 422HQ, which was the one that I defaulted to initially. Now this is, um, Apple describes this as a, um, a codec that preserves visual quality at the same high level as Apple ProRes um, 4444, but at a 422 image um, compression. It calls it visually lossless. And it's the highest quality professional HD video that a single link HD-SDI signal can carry. So we're at the upper end of data transfer um, limits here. It records at 422, as I say, and it can record 10-bit um, pixel depths in a visually lossless way. Now, whereas the in-camera data transfer was 144 megabits per second, uh, this codec requires, its target data rate is approximately 220 megabits per second, so probably about 50% higher than the in-camera data transfer. Now at this point I'm going to flick over, that's a 1080p calculation. I'm, I record at 4K, uh, 24 frames per second, so from here on I'm going to use those figures. And as we've talked about in other videos, when you step up from 1080p to 4K, that's a big step up because you've got four times as many pixels, uh, roughly. So with the Apple ProRes 422HQ codec, the data transfer target rate um, for 4K is 707 megabits per second, which equates to about 318 gigabytes per hour. So that's a pretty big step up. So flicking that over, if you could record this onto an XQD card, your standard 64 gigabyte card would hold only 12 minutes of footage. So that's the highest um, quality ProRes codec. The next one down is the Apple ProRes 422. And Apple described this as a high quality compressed codec offering nearly all the benefits of ProRes HQ but at 66% of the data rate. So it's still really good quality but it's better for perhaps real-time editing performance, multi-stream um, and here the target data rate for 4K, if you remember the for the 422HQ was 707 megabits per second. For 4K at 422, 
it's 471 megabits per second, which equates to 212 gigabytes per hour. So quite a, um, a step down in requirement, but still pretty heavyweight requirement. There is a third codec, which is the ProRes 422LT. And again, this is still a 422 codec, um, but as Apple describes it, with roughly 70% of the data rate and 30% smaller file sizes than 422. Um, so this is, Apple say this is perfect for environments where um, there are capacity challenges and data rates are at a premium. Um, and here the 4K target data transfer rate is 328 megabits per second, giving 148 gigabytes per hour. So your 64 gigabyte card would hold 26 minutes of footage. So you've got three codecs there that give various quality rates with various levels of compression and various data transfer rates. And it's easy to see why when you're shooting at 4K, why you need an external device with an HD, HDMI connection to it to be able to get this level of data transfer between the sensor in the camera and the recording device. So flicking across to the Avid DNxR HDR codex, now I, there was a lot less information around for me to do research on these. Um, but if I, if I look, you've got four different levels of codec. You've got the HQX, which is a 12-bit um, codec. You've got HQ, which is 8-bit. You've got SQ, which is standard quality, which is 8-bit. And you've got low bandwidth, which again is an 8-bit, at the lower end of quality and bandwidth trade-off. So if we look at each of those, and again, we'll talk about 4K um, target data rates at 24 frames per second. The HQX, which is the 12-bit version, and the HQ at 8-bit have the same target data transfer rate of 666 megabits per second. So up there with the um, Apple ProRes 422 HQ kind of level. The standard quality 8-bit is down at 460 megabits per second. I say down there, it's still pretty high. Um, and the low bandwidth LB 8-bit codec is at 171 megabits per second. So we've got, again, a variety there. So when, with these seven different options of ProRes or Avid, we've got a very wide spectrum of different target data rates, different qualities, different compression rates. Uh, that we've got to consider, which is where the real challenge comes in. So it's about marrying the real world performance with your use case. So that was the theory, but I wanted to understand how the real world use married up with the white paper and the various technical information. So what I did was I recorded one minute clips with each of the codecs at 4K 24 frames per second. I then measured the file size and I only measured the file size. I didn't look at the quality because in my use cases, um, as I said, even in camera is good enough for YouTube 4K small screen simple um, simple video production and therefore I didn't have too many other dimensions I had to consider. I recorded an 8-bit neutral colour profile of a standard scene. I then recorded one minute clips with the lens cap on um, just to see what the compression rate would be for a scene that was pretty much all one um, level of exposure and luminosity. I also did, just out of interest, um, the same for 10-bit capture. These aren't precise, they are slightly imprecise real-world tests, and I only did them once, I didn't do multiple and take an average, um, but it gave me enough information to see the real-world performance and make the decisions that I needed to, because it's a trade-off between the quality, the um, capacity of the cards you've got, the bandwidth, and then that post-processing that you've got to balance off to get to where what is the right solution for you. So let's look at the results for the um, test that I did. So I did various scenarios. They're here on the screen. Um, and the data I captured, as I said, was pretty one-dimensional. It was the um, size of the file for a one-minute video. And that's what all the, the figures are on the right-hand side of the table. 
Um, as you can see, if you're shooting in camera, you get about one gigabyte per minute for that 8-bit footage at 420 using the H.264 codec, so that's our baseline. What I did find was that the um, other codecs, the ProRes and the um, Avid DNX HR codecs, did perform in line with the white paper. There was a little bit of a margin uh, performance margin, but that's to be expected in a real-world test where it wasn't particularly scientific. You know, I may have been recording 61, 62 seconds or 58 seconds. There is a little bit of a, a margin for error, but it was reasonably consistent with the white papers. Interestingly, there was little difference between recording 8-bit and 10-bit, so that does give you an option. If um, file size is constrained, you can still shoot 10-bit if you want that extra latitude um, for more challenging situations. As I said, for most of my use case, particularly the studio case like this video where I've got controlled lighting, I don't have that wide um, latitude that I require and I don't want to do too much post-processing um, of the videos. Actually in-camera is good enough and therefore that's my baseline still. However, if I want to go outside and I've got a more um, challenging situation where I want more latitude to play around in post-processing with the video, then for me the balance is probably the ProRes LT and that's what I'm experimenting with um, at the moment. It is about twice the file size, but it's not up at five times the file size where initially I had the um, settings at ProRes 422HQ. So that's for my use cases. Obviously, things you've got to consider um, are you may, if you're doing more complex videos, you may have to fit with the requirements of multi-camera setups and therefore you may be um, told which codecs that you have to use so you can fit with the workflow. Equally, my um, workflow is fairly simple. I shoot, edit, upload. Um, however, if you're going to be doing a number of decodes and re-encoding, you may want to go for a higher quality um, codec so that you don't see the degradation of quality through each of those um, encodings and, and re-encodings. So that may be a consideration for you. As I said, on outdoor more complex um, video shoots, I'm playing around with N-Log and I'll perhaps do another video on that. And I'm looking at 10-bit, which if I record that into the Ninja using the ProRes LT, actually only creates files that are about 2.5 gigabytes per minute. So it's only a small um, uh, trade-off in terms of file size versus the latitude you get there. However, when you come to post-processing, it takes longer to actually turn the N-Log back into a color graded um, footage. So that's another learning experience I'm going on to see whether I can get that um, skill set so it becomes easier for me to give me an even bigger performance envelope I can play with using the Ninja 5 and the Z6. So my conclusions are that the Ninja 5 gives you a lot of options and that's brilliant. However, just because you get those options doesn't mean you should use them. There are trade-offs and it's important to consider what you need. So let me know in the comments below, where are you on your hybrid um, camera video evolution. Have you got a Ninja 5? Are you looking at up in your capabilities in terms of video production? Will the Ninja 5 give you that latitude because you can record in different codecs? You can record with 10-bit versus 8-bit. You can use the N-Log um, profile, which again gives you more latitude. Let us know in the comments below. It'd be great to get a bit of a discussion going um, and learn from each other on this. So as always, I hope you found this video useful. Hopefully it's not too long, but it's given a balance of detail and technical um, insight versus real world use case and helped you perhaps accelerate your um, capabilities in video production. As always, if you enjoyed it, hit subscribe, hit the notification bell. It does help keep the channel um, rolling along and it's been great to have you on this journey and I look forward to seeing you on the next video.